Tatum with Atlanta Functional Programming. Today, we are going to be talking about and journeying into uh, the QTools library, which is a nice set of wrapper libraries uh, for the um, QT application framework. Now, before I get started, I wanted to just briefly mention to those that are joining who might be thinking that um, QTools is going to be dealing with like uh, frameworks later than QT5 uh, point in the 5x line that um, and for reasons that I will um, mention shortly uh, it actually is on the QT QT version 4 um, so and um, we'll we'll begin with that so my apologies for folks watching the stream thinking, hey, we have the ability to write QT5 applications using this nice little library. There are reasons that that, that hasn't happened yet. So um, uh, apologies ahead of time, uh, but you know, let's get uh, let's get started. Um, so a little bit about um, what QT is for folks who haven't used QT. QT is an is an application framework. Um, that's written in C++. It was originally created by a company called Trolltech that has since gone through a number of ac acquisitions, um, most recently uh, with, uh, it's now, I think, part of Digia, um, who has now created, who split it off into what's called the QT company that's uh, kind of continuing to um, merge uh, the framework is most popular with um, the KDE development environment in Linux. Although I've seen other people use it for various other projects, it's pretty much become like the de facto UI framework on the C++ side for folks who want to write cross-platform user interfaces. Um, given um, this history, um, way back, I think first time I seen it was probably 2007. It might be even er older than that. Um, some folks started an effort to actually try and create bindings for uh, QT using um, in common Lisp. And that uh, created um, the common QT um, uh, Lisp bindings for, um, for Qt. Uh, but common QTs has been somewhat, um, it has a, it's a bit limited um, in terms of how you would leverage it. It's a very thin wrapper in that you could straight up go into the QT documentation, find a function, and using some of common QT's macros, you can actually go and um, design your UI, um, which makes it not as lispy as it can be. Um, plus, some, there are some additional tools that you needed to take care of in it with relation uh, to like memory management, object handling, and marshaling and demarshaling of um, arguments between the Lisp side and the C++ side. So Shinmara created this nice little uh, utility called QTools that allows you to essentially hide some of that complexity and make it easier for you to you know, stay focused on actually writing a Qt application. And he even provided ways for you to actually go in and hook into ASDIF to actually um, build the system. So we're gonna provide some examples um, to go and uh, do this. Um, I've already created uh, kind of a demo project based on uh, the uh, um, documenta documented um, project that's already um, provided in um, the uh, QTools documentation that we'll just go through. When you first start out, and I'm going to just you know show you the uh, the uh, as the file, you want to. Um, you know, obviously, um, load up um, QTools has a dependency here. Um, it will internally um, uh, pull in Common QT um, and a couple of other libraries too, as well, um, related to like some bindings uh, to uh, you know build your QT applications or more convenient libraries. Um, one of them is actually. Um, the generated um, list bindings through um, uh, smoke. Uh, it provides kind of like a C wrapper around um, Qt so that uh, common Qt can actually go and hook into it. So if you go into the, um, and I'll just briefly show, you know, this uh, directory structure for some of the curious folks here. Um, 
in um and this might actually happen sometimes in uh where was it it was um uh q tools it is hmm interesting i thought i had it in here if you go and look into um common qt's um i mean sorry in your uh Wherever you go and install your QTools um, library in your in your Lisp system using Quick Lisp, um, you will notice that what it does is um, is Common Qt pulls in um, the the last version built version of Qt for I think it's like four eight, um, and it will install it in that directory so that it could then um, leverage the smoke bindings and load everything into the Lisp system at the appropriate time when you load it up. Each of the libraries in Qt is its own separate DLL. So like, and it is a very massive framework. So we were not going to be able to cover everything on it, but to name a couple of things that are available to you, um, it has a networking library, uh, which gives you an abstraction to be able to um, do like socket programming that uh, QTools um, exposes. It has um, the GUI library, of course, right? The GUI applications. Um, if you want to write a core application that hooks into some, you know, uh, C bindings or C++ bindings that you have. Um, it uh, has this way of writing command line applications using Qt core um, and so on and so forth. Now, for for GUI applications, which is kind of the focus that um, I'm going to be kind of touching base on today, um, Qt um, requires you to have both Qt core and Qt GUI to actually be available to the system because Qt core is kind of like the, the core um, data structures that uh, Qt provided um, before, I'll mention before, uh, like the standard template library added a bunch of nice little conveniences that weren't there. Plus it, um, these same data structures like QList, QVector and so forth um, has um, signals and slots hooked into it. So you can go and change, look at how the data structures um, are actually leveraged. Um, but let's, uh, let's start to talk about, you know, building a basic GUI application on it. Um, like I said, um, you need to, uh, create your as the um, project. What I did was here is is I added um, a Qt GUI project, which is I'm creating, which means I need three libraries, QTools, which is the convenience uh, libraries that uh, that we're going to be going over today, and then Qt Core and Qt GUI are specific common Qt uh, smoke bindings that are going to get loaded into the Lisp image when you when you start developing. These are actually leveraged by QTools later on. Um, so that we can actually access the Qt API. So let's go to um, our basic uh, example here. When you're using QTools, um, there are two ways to actually um, start uh, leveraging the APIs um, that I want to briefly mention here. Um, and we'll see this in an example. One, you may have noticed here already that um, I am leveraging um, a read table that QTools provides. Um, this, uh, so QTools internally use named read tables. Um, so when you do in read table QTools, it will um, actually load in its own like a uh, um, read table for the Lisp image. It'll replace it actually with its own thing. Um, that's what we actually are leveraging here when we define the um, the package. So when you first define the package, um, most people probably already do this. Um, you would originally probably do CL. Um, hold on. For some reason, my okay. Originally, you would probably do something like this. You'll have um, CL um, being the default package to get all the common list exported symbols, and then you would start writing. QTools already exports all of um, um, CL, pl and plus it provides its own wrappers inside its read table. So when you're developing a, Q a QT application using QTools, you don't want to actually use CL, you'd want to actually use CL plus QT, which will export all of CL plus whatever common QT needs and some convenient uh, macros that um, are leveraged by QTools to um, 
that will de help you develop your applications. Um, also, when you are um, starting your um, your application, the in read table has to occur inside the package that you are actually um, going to work on um, because it is actually uh, going to be uh, leveraged by this package um, when you load it at read time. If you do it before that, um, you might you, you will get an error because um, CL plus QT, I don't think, um, even though you loaded the image, it will actually recognize that you could uh, replace. I mean, the, the thing there is really just that you should be doing named read tables colon in read table, right? It's just that CL plus QT actually exports the in read table symbol. Right. So you'd want to do, uh, I am seriously, name read tables, you're saying this, right? Yep. And now you could put that above the in package. Right. Okay. Got it. Okay. Actually, you know what? This actually looks a little uh, better. So we know that it's coming from name read tables. I'm going to just keep it this way. <laughs> um, okay. Let me go to my list people. All right. So let's load this project up. Two tools workshop. All right, and let's go into the package itself. So at the top of every QT application, all right, um, you are going to be normally uh, hooking in to um, a window. You're going to start a Q, Q, Q application normally in C++. You start the Q application, add your widgets, do app.run, and then um, it will go ahead and load up a window with whatever widgets that you provided in. Um, and it will um, then um, uh, start the event loop for you. Um, the way you do this in Q tools, well, in using Q tools and in common QT, is you need to define a widget. Um, this top level widget is going to be the parent for all the smaller level UI widgets that you're going to be leveraging here. So to do this in um, using QTools is QTools provides this nice set of defined macros that we can actually leverage to actually create um, our top level widgets in the subsequent um, uh, GUI hierarchy. Uh, top level widget um, is defined like defined widget, um, main window with the uh, Q widget itself. Um, there's something else here that um, I should mention. Um, this is kind of like your def class, as you can see here. Um, it here instead of using um, like your Lisp classes, you are providing like your um, your uh, QT class that you are subclassing from. Now you're not um, going to have have the ability to do uh, direct super. I don't think you could do direct super classes from the QT side, but you have one main widget that you're going to subclass from, and then the rest are, I think, other subclass super classes that you defined in the um, the common um, uh, QT side on the common Lisp side um, that you've already defined. Um, then, of course, this is like your standard um, thing. You have some direct slots that you could provide here. Since this is a top-level widget, and we're going to be providing other widgets associated with it, um, we don't, uh, and we don't have any state that we're going to actually be managing here um, within this widget. Uh, I just went ahead and, um, and this is kind of what the documentation um, tells you to do if you're creating top-level windows. Um, not to provide any sort of slots and slots and slot information here. Um, this last option about options. Um, I'm not entirely sure what those options are from the uh, common QT and Q tool side is. I've been trying to look into that for folks who are kind of um, more familiar with that piece um, because that sound that looks like more of an advanced thing that um, uh, that touches into like maybe like the meta classes. Um, that uh, please go ahead and let me know. Um, please write it into the YouTube stream or even um, uh, go ahead and um, provide us um, 
some uh, information regarding that and um, we will go ahead and uh, um, uh, uh, respond um, accordingly. After you define the top level um, widget, obviously you, you, uh, having just a window won't you know let you do anything right you need to you need to obviously add some some ui stuff to it so to add stuff to the ui you need to first define the sub widgets first um these are your children of um, the top level widget um one nice interesting thing about um these defined macros that um like define sub widget, we are using the generalized variable or the setf expander kind of like syntax to actually go and define them. So what you do is, is you have main window, the name of the child, um, and then you define, you know, what type of um, uh, widget this guy is. In this case, we are using Q plus. Q plus is actually um, both um, a macro, a reader macro and um, in this case, it's it will export the symbols using um, uh, the uh, when you did um, in read table. So each of the um, Qt GUI classes um, will have a uh, corresponding make function in QTools. So like if you want to do um, uh, Q line edit here, you would have um, make Q line edit all lowercase has the corresponding constructor of that particular QT widget inside common uh, the common Lisp side. Once you've instantiated this, obviously you, you have the ability now to play with um, uh, properties um, of that uh, that widget. One of them in the uh, Q line edit thing is, is obviously providing a placeholder's text. Um, so. Um, this placeholder text um, name is um, allowing you to have the ability to uh, specify, like in the case of the, the placeholder, you just have to specify your name, and then um, it'll be inside the widget. And when you hit, uh, you know, edit, it will go ahead and remove. You probably you've you've seen this in a lot of um, you know forms that you may have written in the past um, in other languages. This is just the same kind of thing that will give you some placeholder text. Um, so I created a Q line edit button here. I mean, Q line edit widget here, as well as a, a, a push button here. Push button is your standard button, regardless of um, whether it's Windows, Linux, or, or, or Mac. It's just, you know, a button that, you know, that you can press. Um, so we have these two widgets. Once these are instantiated, this is creating the Kind of like your DOM, it creates um, like a, a tree of the top level widget being your main window, and then your children widgets are both hooked up to the, the top level um, widget. Um, but these aren't actually laid out yet. You have to actually hook them up into a layout, and then you need to specify that layout as being part of main window. And this is what this sub widget um, main window layout does. There are two types of layouts in. Um, QT, VBox layout and HBox layout for widgets. Um, you have the ability to add also things like expanders and um, uh, vertical, um, both horizontal and vertical expanders to go and readjust the, the widget so that they get nice and plushed against the side. Um, again, there's a lot of them. Um, I suggest you look at the cute documentation for your particular needs. Um, here we're using a uh, QH box layout to actually lay them horizontally, and we just add the um, widgets in in the order in which we want to actually um, uh, specify them on the UI to the layout itself. So QT add widget layout and the widget name will allow you to hook up um, these particular widgets to that layout. A lot of this for folks who are coming from like you've seen LTK last week. Um, and even probably UI programming in other language um, in other languages, um, excluding maybe HTML because HTML forces you to write your UI at the at the markup level. Um, this is probably not as um, foreign to you, um, but um, it shows out that uh, there are some nice little conveniences that um, QTools has provided. Um, to make things a little easier for us to actually uh, specify our uh, GUI hierarchy. 
and I encourage you to look at the C++ equivalent to look at this because I've seen um, in C++, um, you would have to define the widget as a class and then specify all the children widget and then you'd have to also have a function that then lays them all out um, once, once instantiated. Now, it's a little bit more boilerplate in there. It's the same kind of structure, same kind of conveniences, but here you could clearly see what the what the hierarchy is. So I, th I think that's kind of a nice thing that Qtools has provided us um, because now you're just really defining your children widgets um, very explicitly and um, you can actually look at it and know what, what each of those um, sub widgets are. Any questions so far? Okay. So this is all, you know, kind of boring, you know, <laughs> we've, we've instantiated this thing, right? Um, we've added all the sub widgets and all that, but um, what's really going to make it interactive is, um, and let me just show this, what this would look like is uh, I went ahead and, um, by the way, um, what we're using here is the with main, main window macro, which is a Q tools specific macro that allows you to deal with um, instantiation and cleaning up of the um, widgets themselves. And when you do this, you will see that it'll pop up a nice little um, Q2 widget that has our Q line edit and go button um, the way we expected it to in the HBox layout that we provided. Um, I noticed that my placeholder text isn't showing up here earlier. Uh, I haven't figured out um, where I may have messed up the uh, the specific uh, Q, pl Q plus um, macro that I'm using for the property to actually go and change it. Um, but um, we'll get to that um, in, in a bit, um, that this is one bug that we, we need to kind of address. But before I get to that, um, I wanted to talk about signals and slots. <coughs> So signals and slots um, in Qt are kind of like your event-driven, um, uh, is an implementation or a, a realization of the event-driven um, paradigm. Um, what happens is, is uh, you have uh, when, you know, the user does something, let's say types some text or even presses a button. Um, what happens at that widget level is, is it will hook into the Qt runtime system and throw um, a message saying, hey, I, I'm such and such button, I pressed this, uh, I, I got pressed, go ahead and you know shoot out the um, whatever, notify all the event uh, slots, which are essentially event handlers that are subscribed to this event to go and do something. Um, when you first instantiate your application, what happens is, is when, um, uh, is, is on the C++ side, what we do is, is you do like a, um, a Q object, I'll just write this as a comment, Q object, connect, and then you specify the widget that, um, uh, that you are trying to hook into the signal that um, that widget is throwing. And if you wanna hook it to another thing, uh, that is going to handle it for you. You specify the destination widget that has the slot that you want to provide. And this syntax will register that, that event handler to the signal in the QT event system. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be just slots, um, uh, signals to slots. Uh, QT gives you the flexibility to do signals to other signals. So you could connect, um, multiple signals together in this nice little chain um, to actually um, reach up to the appropriate place where uh, you want to do something. But regardless of whether they're a signal or slot, what happens is, is <clears throat> what happens is, is uh, the, uh, each slot gets thrown into a list and it will iterate through that list and just call each of the, those functions one at a time. To do this on the common Lisp side, the same kind of registration has this connect. We have to first define the signal that we're going to be creating. In this case, we're not using you know a default signal specifically. We're using we're creating our own signal on this main window because this main window is a subclass. We're calling it name set, 
and we're taking in a string. Now, for every um, signal that we connect, we need we could have a corresponding slot. Um, here, if you see in our uh, slot of uh, Go, main window Go, we're basically saying, okay, um, when Go is pressed or when we press enter um, in, um, on the, um, the Q line edit, this slot is going to be handled and it's going to throw a signal called name set string. It will grab the, uh, the, the text that is already defined in the string and it will go ahead and um, uh, send that signal to whatever slots that are registered to it. Now, one thing, and this is probably the first point of um, discussion that I'd like to bring up to the audience, um, the people that are on the call, is, is I noticed that um, we have to specify I've, it's, I've seen this in the documentation and other places where we're specifying the signals in, one after the other sequentially. Is there any problems with me doing something like this? Uh, where I can have a single declare statement. Um, Depends how Shinmara is parsing the declares there, but probably not. So let's try this. Um, I'll first show um, you the uh, how this kind of worked um, for the time being, but that is a point of discussion that I want to bring up at least to think about because I'm curious as to the, the how how that's all kind of worked out. Um, so there really shouldn't be a problem. Um, so the the way that typically you set up custom declarations. Uh -huh. Like they're they're meant to just like register information. They typically don't have to do any, especially here. It's not going to do it. There shouldn't be doing any sort of lookup. So the order wouldn't matter on them. So it's the not only time order, it's just making sure that uh, whatever is parsing the declares there can parse multiple declares at once, which it probably can. I mean, like he's yeah. probably just using Alexandria's body parser, and I know that handles it properly. So yeah, exactly. So <clears throat> um, that's a good point. Um, I, I, I would assume that it should work. I didn't try it, but I brought it up because I noticed it in other places. I'm guessing they just copied the, the pattern, assuming that you know there was a reason why it was designed that way. I haven't tested it, but we'll test it out um, just to see if it kind of works. But before I do that, I just want to also mention this slot. Um, that we created for the name set, which hooks into um, the uh, the uh, <clears throat> it hooks into whenever it uh, the it's registered whenever the main window sends off the the name set string to a uh, just some code that will create a queue message box window um, that would provide you know. Uh, just some information regarding what was passed into the queue line edit. But let's go through each of these at uh, one at a time a little bit. So first, a connected thing. Um, the connected thing is um, a, uh, you're just mentioning in the declaration, it's a custom declaration that takes in a widget first, and then um, it takes in a list of, uh, of signals um, that, uh, that we're registering this, um, the signal, um, the slot to. It could be just one like we have here. It could be multiple um, uh, for a given widget. Um, but when you have multiple or one, you have to specify them in this list. And um, at the when this cuts compiled and actually run, it will go ahead and register all of them into the event system. Um, the next thing to note is, is the signal bang. Um, since we are using um, read table in read table, and additionally, um, I think this is exported differently. Um, you may notice that we are not actually um, doing a Q plus colon here. Um, I'm not sure, but I think it's because this is um, this is uh, because uh, it's not exported as part of the Q plus package when you add in um, uh, when you do the read table, um, but. 
uh, again, correct me if I'm wrong, um, if that's, if that's not the case. Um, finally, um, this is a new widget that we haven't talked about, um, which is queue, by, queue message box information. Again, it's just a standard message box, but queue mess message box has many different types of um, uh, messages. Uh, you have to normally specify in the queue message box what type. It's an enumeration in C++, um, whether it's a warning, an error, or, or an information dialogue that you're specifying um, information, um, more more uh, visual information to, to the end user. It requires you to provide um, a title. That's what this greetings is. Um, and a custom message that will be um, displayed on um, the actual main text box of the dialogue. Uh, one thing to note, um, format nil obviously is just, you know, go, using the formatter to, to generate a string. So it will go and return a string here. Now, before we, we, we test this application, one more thing that I'm going to point out is, is once everything is all this is done, you run like we did before the with the main window uh, macro on instantiating the top level, dang it, on instantiating the top level um, widget that will then, you know, hook everything up, register all the signals and slots into the event loop, and then execute the actual application. Now, I specified a function called QTools main here, QTools workshop main here, specifically because later on, when we talk about deployment, um, you'll see where this becomes very, very useful. So let's go ahead and run our main function here. Notice if you go ahead and, you know, hit enter, it's, it, what happened is, as you see where it says connected name return press, that signal calls the main window go slot that will then shoot up um, the name set uh, signal that then gets handled and creates um, this nice little information window for you. Same thing if you go ahead and add, you know, the, uh, when you do when you press um, the actual button itself, um, this is uh, kind of pretty cool because now what you're doing is is before if you were using um, uh, the C plus plus side of this, um, you you may know that um, you would have to add these these connections explicitly for each one, and they may be all over the place. This gives you a nice way of at least within the children widget uh, of a top level widget for you to go down and say, you know what? All these um, signals are hooked to the same slot. I don't need to connect to them one at a time. I could just go ahead and declare all the signals that are associated with this one slot. And then I'll give you the application of um, logic uh, regarding to what should happen when this slot is called. This is a very nice little way of actually defining your signals and slot that keeps everything kind of isolated into a single single location, allow you to manage your widgets a little bit better. Um, of course, um, with uh, some of the new um, versions of Qt that came out since uh, Qt4, uh, they added some nice conveniences to implement some of this. Uh, unfortunately, uh, what happened is, is uh, Common QT uh, leverages a library called Smoke to go ahead and create the C wrappers, as I mentioned. Um, and it's a lot of work to actually go in and um, take like a library as large as QT with all of its widgets and stuff to actually um, go through the kinks, create the kind of convenience functions, make sure everything gets tested. Also, Smoke. From what I can tell, I've been reading it on it recently. I can't really seem to find the new version of Smoke that is used, <laughs> um, to um, see how to create a C wrapper library around um, QT5. So because of all this, um, uh, what was decided on is this common QT will stay around with QT48. Um, and um, Shinmara added some really nice utilities on top of that common QT library, as we saw here. Um, before we talk about deployment, are there questions regarding just QT and just general structure? All right. Let's, uh, let me just check the stream. Um, you guys don't mind to see if there are any questions. Mm 
my apologies. I need to, I don't have the, the stream uh, available at this time. Just to go into oh, there. Okay. All right. Yeah. So there aren't, okay, so there aren't any questions here. So let's talk about deployment. We see our um, example, this is a nice little example um, of an application that's fully fully written, it's ready to go. Let's say that this is our, 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 um, our example. We wanna go ahead and deploy this. Well, it's, from this you could clearly see we cannot actually do this within our, um, our, our REPL, our, our Sly REPL because of the fact that, you know, when we try and build this guy within um, Sly, we would have to, um, we'll end up um, pulling in Sly, Slink, all of its other dependencies on top of whatever QT, QTools have, and then it will dump an image that will have our application. We don't want that. So we'd have to first do a couple of things to our ASD to actually go and set it up to be able to be built. So to do this, we'll go back to our ASD. We have um, QTools provides a nice little build operation on top of ASDIF called the QT program opt. What it does is, is because again, um, this is a wrapper around a C++ library, you need to pull in all the shared objects from for all the dependent libraries that you are using in your application. You need to also um, build the application so that um, it recognizes the symbols all being located in the same directory. And then um, you have to also do a couple of other things before you could just go ahead and dump the image. So Qt Program Op already does all that for you. What you can do is, is you can provide a build operation that calls this Qtools convenience operation. And you can also specify the executable name. Um, right now, uh, what I've done is, is I've provided in the build path name just you know the location, um, to being in my home directory, um, well, in my project directory, um, what the name of the application should be. But this could be, since it's a path name, I'm assuming it, it can be an actual path to a specific um, um, a directory that you could provide to. I haven't actually tried this out, but that's based on the name of the actual key binding there. I, I'm assuming that that's the case. Then you have to also specify an entry point. Folks, we've talked about, you know, in the past about how ASDIF works, this entry point thing is basically um, at notifying ASDIF that you need to call this function at the time that the image is actually dumped. When you want to run this um, and, and build the actual application, you would want to run it on the command line um, or you can, you know, use a shell for this um, inside Emacs. I just have a command line open that has this. And you want to use the following command. I'm if you're using Roswell, which is what I'm using, um, you'd want to do Ros dash capital L SB, SBCL dash Ben run, and then specify the uh, same um, parameters that are that's in the documentation, mainly eval, and then run um, the uh, this following operation, which is uh, as if operate call the build up. The name of the package that you're using. This is the actual ASD file that gets loaded, um, QTools Workshop, and then um, force true will be a force recompile. Um, when you do this, it will go ahead, grab all the dependent libraries, grab, um, load it up into memory, um, hook up the um, main application, and then it will just dump the image. Now, where is this located? This is located in your project directory in the bin um, location. So if you go to bin, what you will see is it has our executable. It also has several uh, shared objects. These are the shared objects that are required to actually run this application. Notice we have our Qt core and Qt GUI um, dependencies that we specified in our ASD, but we also have um, four other um, files. And this is all the machinery needed to actually hook into common Qt so that we are actually leveraging um, a Qt internal, internally in our Lisp image. Those are your smoke um, libraries created from smoke gen. 
And that includes data structures that are needed to actually create the wrappers themselves, which is defined in smoke base. And then we we have our, our wrapper libraries from smoke as well. Um, and those three libraries need to be loaded in order before you actually load common QT and then actually run the executable. Now, all this long-winded explanation um, is mainly for so that when you run this actual application, you understand what's happening behind the scenes. And, and you notice that um, when you run it on the command line, it provides you some additional um, information, where the runtime directory is, what the resource directory is, um, and um, some additional um, initialization code that QTools needs before it actually uh, starts uh, launching the actual application. You'll see that this application still works like what we did before, um, which is mainly, you know, write some text inside of a queue line at it and hook into the machinery um, for QT to actually go and display information message box. Now, this is a simple application that we've gone through, but it actually shows you the, the full um, range of what you can do with um, QTools in a very, in, in not too many, you know, um, functions. If you go back and actually look at what we've talked about, um, any application that you see here will have some sort of top level widget. You can have additional child level widgets that you could define yourself. Um, you have the ability to define signals and slots for your your application to hook around events. And then you could just, you know, start your application. Now, is that it, you might ask? Um, there's a lot of stuff in QT that we have not covered in here that's kind of exposed inside um, QTools. Additionally, I haven't brought up how a lot of this stuff is kind of managed behind the scenes because since we are using um, my C++ library, there is a marshalling and unmarshalling of the um, of the objects that are being passed in through um, Qt and back into the um, Lisp side. Uh, that requires us to kind of talk about the the individual components that are that are available for within QTools. Um, one of them uh, we could start talking about is uh, the name conversions that QTools do. Um, so if you look at, um, so a couple of QTools um, functions that we could use is like, if you wanna know uh, a particular class name uh, for uh, a, a QT class name for a given um, widget, we can actually go ahead and use um, the find QT class name, it, um, there is a, it searches a set, a set of tables that are actually available to us in QT class map. So if you run this, you can actually see that there's actually a hash um, between um, that of strings to their appropriate QT classes. So if we go and actually um, look up this and inspect it, you'll see for each um, abstract animation, this is these are the associated classes associated with it. So um, what this QT class name, uh, find QT class name guy does is, is if you, I think, specify Q abstract button, it will go ahead, look up to see if um, Q abstract button is available, and it'll tell you what the, what the class name of it actually is inside the um, thing. Now, obviously, as you can see here, I'm not actually using it the way um, they would run. They might actually do something like this, and you'll see it'll take the Lisp uh, symbol, Q abstract button, strip the, sim um, the dashes, up the, you know, create camel case for it, and actually generate the actual class name that you need. Um, you can also uh, translate method names the same way. They have something called um, uh, two method name that takes in 
what we would normally write in our Lisp side, like in our name set side here, what we had earlier, and it'll convert it to the appropriate um, QT style um, uh, camel case and then register it. There's a lot of other things that, it get, that, are, that are available, but um, these are just a couple of things that you could use for introspection. Um, we have a bunch of things that, um, that are available to us that are equivalent to type of and um, EQL and all that from um, CL. Um, so like, for example, you have QT type of that takes in, you know, if we took, uh, let me just uh, run, you know, my main here, delete it and then see if I can do this. QT type of um, star. You will notice that the previous um, object that was just deleted, it is um, uh, recognized as being a const Q object star. You have, uh, it also provides um, additional meta information that you could do to navigate through um, the type hierarchy and actually go and look at through um, the QT classes. So I'm going to stop here for, 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 for a brief minute because um, what I'm about to get to uh, next is object handling and Kind of curious if other folks have um, actually played around with some of these um, um, in inspection objects that are available in um, QTools, and what were your thoughts on, like uh, some of the like you know best practices? Like, do we do we need to use like say two type name or two method name at all, or is this more just like exploring the API when we're developing our applications and learning the library the first time? Has anybody else used these? Um, so I haven't used um, QTools specifically, uh, nor mm -hmm. any other like QT framework here. Um, mm -hmm. But you see kind of similar-ish sorts of things whenever you're doing any sort of FFI. So like CFFI has a couple utility, you know, it does its own name conversions for like camel case, snake case, and so on. Um, okay. So I think for this, it's more like like it's it's using it internally to do those mappings anyway, okay. and so it's just kind of like exposed. So you get you can make use of it, you know, if you're trying to 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 find a specific class name or uh, trying to do that mapping yourself, because you know it's an automated system, right? So it's right. helpful to have a way to kind of poke at it. Right. Right. So mm -hmm. that, I imagine that be the main purpose, or or rather, I think it's just that it's used internally, and why not expose it? You know, right, right, okay. Um, this is one area that I'm not, um, I haven't had a chance to really dig into. So um, I'm hoping that we can have some discussion on this um, because this is also related to FFI in general. Um, and then doing marshaling, unmarshaling. But one of the no, one of the problems with dealing with libraries, whether they're written in C or C++, is the fact that since there's no garbage collector, you have to go and make sure that you clean up correctly after yourself. Otherwise, you're going to end up creating a memory leak accidentally um, or intentionally, if that was your choice. Um, <laughs> so there is um, a couple of things that you, you may need to do that uh, that aren't governed by us that QTools provides for at least the QT objects. And this is the, the finalizers that they created um, using the finalized generic function. Now I'm assuming that they grabbed this kind of notation from, from say Java because Java has also finalizers and closers and all the, the, this kind of stuff for dealing with um, some of the stuff, especially if you're dealing with JNI. Um, but it's still kind of curious to me because I haven't seen other libraries adopt this kind of, you know, uh, architecture all um, decision of creating a generic function and specializing it for each Q objects. Normally, I've always seen stuff like um, the width macro. You have some sort of ability to use, hey, with this resource, go ahead and do these kinds of things, right? And we have that with, with the top level main window that we saw earlier. Um, 
where it instantiates some window and allows you to go and execute some code on it. But is this actually a pattern in other FFI libraries where we um, generate these finalizers and... Well, um, so, uh, really, uh, well, so for, for one thing, uh, the the finalized function in Qtools is really more, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's an immediate, it, like, it's actually a, a thing, you, it's, it's free. Like, it's, it's a C, it's, it's sort of like a C level free operation, right? It actually yeah, runs yeah, whatever yeah. cleanup That's stuff right. and then, and then deallocates the thing. Right. Um, so it, it, it's not like a finalizer in the Java sense, right? Oh, because okay. A finalizer it's... in the Java sense is, uh, is a function that gets called right before garbage collection of an object. Um, and that's not what this is. Um, you can have QTools attach finalize as a finalizer on the CL wrapper, right? That is a thing you can do. But did, um, hmm? okay, so this is kind of a, a misnomer. So this is really free. This is more freeing rather than scheduling it Correct. to to be freed. Um, okay. Yeah, it's like if you've done C sharp, it's the equivalent of a dispose. Yeah. on there you know just like a a very um like a common way so the, the the thing with with macros is that for common qt like there there are literally i mean you look at that hash tables there's like literally hundreds of types of objects that might need to be like disposed differently right so you're not going to write like a with you know, with image, with animation, with button, with event dispatcher, like so, it, it, that just doesn't scale. So right. instead, you you have this generic sort of like with this resource, you know, and at the end of it, no matter what type of resource it is, you can call finalize on it. Yep, yeah. and and that's what and that's what there is. There's a there's a with finalize, uh, yeah, with finalizing macro. Yeah. There's a yeah. with finalizing macro. And here's here's why I thought it was like um, the one in Java. So the way Q objects work is um, when you create a tree of Q objects internally, um, it kind of takes the the Java approach in the C plus plus side in that it makes sure that when a top level Q object um, gets destroyed, um, it will make sure that you know to prevent you know memory leaks and resource leaks especially. Um, that all of the Q objects that are registered with um, to that top level Q object, it's children that represents the tree. Um, they all appropriately get destroyed correctly um, because you've registered it as being as this. So you don't necessarily need to call their destructors or a call delete explicitly. Instead, it will go ahead and do that um, cleanup for you. Q object will do that cleanup for you. Um, now, of course, that sounds you know, more like a, a side effect of just the way that QT's, you know, cleanup stuff works. Yes, that's exactly why. Oh, oh, right. That's how it does it. So I assume that the finalize kind of hooks into, you know, presumably hooks into that kind of the same same way, because, you know, otherwise, if it's trying to do manual delet deletions itself or tries to be smart for doing a free it kind of, especially in the QT side, you're going to end up doing something inadvertently and causing a memory leak. So I, I'm, i but I'm assuming, I'm guessing that would be at the common QT level, not necessarily at the Q tools level. Probably. Um, so. Have to go look. Yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it, like, um, you know, you see a fairly common pattern of wrap a foreign object, you know, lisp side object, and then, you know, you dispose of it using uh, something you could dispatch on with that object. I, I've seen that in a few places. Interesting. It, it just scales nicer. Um, but yeah, that's because not you... a finalizer in the, in the Java sense. Okay. Well, it's, it's not automatic. It's not automatic. Well, it's, it's, I would say that it's not strictly in the java sense but the fact that it's using qt you're still you're still kind of doing it well you're you're calling qt's yeah. finalize uh, yeah. or its destructor rather or whatever right. cleanup function qt provides right yeah. but exactly. but but the finalized function on the cl side isn't getting called automatically 
Right. Okay. Got it. Now, important. Now. That's that's what would be more like what goes on in the JVM world. Yeah. Right. Right. And, and as I mentioned, like you can also do. Uh, where is it? Uh, with GC finalized, yes. which actually, uh, um, uh, you know, does does some trickery to basically do an extra box that gets cleaned up. Um, Got it. Yeah. yeah. Well, Lisp itself doesn't follow the way um, Java JVM does. Um, it does actually. A little, right? No, so it does yeah. actually. Although no one uses it intentionally, and I get angry at people that use it because actually JVM style finalizers suck for a lot of reasons. So I've never seen. Is this in the hyperspec somewhere? Nope. So it's not part of common Lisp, but pretty much every implementation yeah, provides okay. trivial garbage. Uh, a hook. Okay, it's a portability library, portability library that provides the API. Got it. Okay, so if you wanted to, well, you, you can should set up a function. <laughs> you can set up a function well, that will get called on some thread when the Lisp system realizes that some particular object is about to be garbage collected because no references are held to it anymore. If it decides to collect, if it decides it to collect it ever, right? <laughs> you, you a you never you don't ever know if that if that function will ever get called. B uh, you don't know what thread it will get called on. And C it's really easy to accidentally write a finalizer that itself closes over a reference to the object that you're trying to finalize, and that doesn't work because the finalizers are strongly held by the garbage collector, and so the finalizer will not be keeping that object alive, and so the object will never be considered garbage and so the finalizer will never get called on it yeah and we can do a actually that might be a good episode in the future yeah um, is to go over those sorts of things because and likewise with the patterns that you were talking about because yeah. I've, I've run into that a, a couple of times and there's there's good patterns to like abstract out um the the finalizers like that mm -hmm. um but it's a matter of the those finalizers are incredibly difficult to get right. Yep. Um, like they are, you think, oh yeah, I'll just set up a finalizer and that way I don't have to like remember to free up this, you know, SDL image. Yep. Uh, but then you realize, oh, well, that's running, you know, after I've initialized SDL and now it's crashing. Or like it's running in a separate thread, like while I'm doing some other SDL stuff and now I get like and, into and that cleanup function calls in SDL internal function that can only be called on the main thread and right you know, so, now so they SDL are SDL starts crying at me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so they are they are notoriously difficult to get right. You you and, can and especially write difficult is because like variability in garbage collection means that you never know if you're going to run into that bug. And it's really easy for your dev environment to change the way that garbage collection happens, which means it's really easy for that to come up as a Heisen bug. And Jeez. it's just a, like yeah, finalizers so, are a pain. Right. They So they yeah. um, my main yeah, use I'm, for them has been, um, yeah. and this is both in Common Lisp and in C Sharp, my main use has been more as a like dev debug aid. So they're a fallback. They're not the main code path. So like each, each and every one of my finalizers in C sharp that I write at work, they they have an if debug, you know, uh, do a log error because if this final or, or rather like it's it's a it's placed on like a disposable object, so an object that should have been cleaned up. Yeah. So the finalizer checks, oh, was it cleaned up before it got garbage collected? If not, then I toss up an error. And I do a little bit of cleanup, but like that's not the intended code path. You know, that's used just for me to debug to figure out. Oh, you know, I I have Something a memory leak. Something's getting leaked here. Yeah, exactly. Right. So they're super useful for that. But yeah. like as far as your main code path, and they're super useful in in CL. If you do, if you use them in that capacity, for like interactive debugging and that like or interactive use like. Oh, I you know I created this image and I lost a reference to it because I'm just typing away at my on my REPL. Right. You know, mm -hmm. it'd be it'd be convenient if it tried to clean it up if it could, but that shouldn't be like your main like expected use case. Like ideally they they never run. Ideally you've just managed the 
your stuff correctly. Right. So they're, they're more of a of a guard has to. Guard That's how I use them. Yeah. Like people people have endless debates on this if you if you look it up online. Yep. Um, and this is not just with CL. Like it's <laughs> especially in the Java world because in the Java world you can resurrect objects and you just end up with crazy stuff. Right. Um, right, because a, cause a, so, a finalizer could, in principle, take a new reference to that object, couldn't it? In Java and C Sharp, yeah, because the, the finalizer actually runs in a context in which this is valid. Like the, the variable this, which points to the, the object getting collected right now, you could actually then like take that reference the and put it somewhere but Wouldn't else. that increase? I, I always thought the finalizer purposely makes it makes an effort to make sure that the reference count doesn't go down. I mean, sorry, it goes up by increasing it because well, well, a, so look, like, in, look at the zombie objects. <laughs> look into like, you can, you can do resurrection from the GC. That's, that's an actual thing. Yep. That's yeah. In, in Java, you can, you can be like, well, this object is about to be uh, garbage collected. Nah, I, I actually need that for something. I'm gonna go ahead and you know take this and store it in some global table. Can't do yeah, that in CL the, because if you if you hold a reference to the object you're trying to finalize in CL, it'll just never get collected in the first place. Yeah, so that is kind of like a a, a nice Although, thing. Actually, but it also wait makes a the things a little bit more. You could hold a weak reference to a CL object in your final. I think I had tested that and that the the weak reference had died. But maybe I'm wrong. Really, that's amusing. Good. I, I'm, I'm yeah. actually quite <laughs> pleased about that. That, <laughs> that at the very it's, least, it's SBCL been a while, is, but yeah, that SBCL is 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 smart enough to get to to clean any re weak references before running any finalizers, because otherwise, that's that's terrible nonsense, and no one should be doing that. <sighs> anyway, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the behavior because I was testing. Because basically, I wanted to in C sharp and Java, like the finalizers are a little bit more convenient in that, like you still have access to all your fields, right? To to where if you're writing a finalizer in uh, in common Lisp, like you don't have, you know, if you're trying to like finalize a struct, yeah, or or a class, like ideally you'd have access to the slots, right, of that structure class. So like to do that is it, it makes things a little awkward because then the pattern that I've ended up with is like my uh, my slots aren't like the actual value. My slots are actually pointers to the values. Mm -hmm. And then in my def finalizer, I just close over those pointers. And then that way, as yeah. those slots change, like my finalizer has like the latest value basically. Um, and it's con it's easy enough to wrap up in a macro. It's just an extra annoying step, basically. Interesting. Well, like I said, this can be another uh, a topic for a discussion for Yeah, this time. is actually a very good and very important topic that we should, I'm making a point to actually <laughs> remind myself that we need to discuss uh, finalizers and just garbage collection in general, um, garbage collection patterns, um, just so that, you know, in a future re reference, we can just dig into all the different types of garbage collection things that Common List provides, how one can actually make sure that they're not being leaky bastards, you know, in, in their code. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. So this today's a kind of a short introduction to this. Um, there's a lot of stuff in, um, Tool that I haven't had a, uh, I've been having some, I'll be honest, a little, little discuss, um, exploratory um, dis uh, discussion with um, some folks. And, and those are related to things like the QT resources system, which for folks who are aware, uh, familiar with QT um, is the uh, one nice thing that QT provides. It allows you to have the ability to embed your resources into your application uses something called the QRC file that allows you to define your 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 icons and text files and text strings and things that you you want as an actual resource um, to be embedded in um, has an XML file that then gets um, 
read in uh, during um, compile time to generate this nice little file system that then embeds all that information into your application that you can then reference as if they're directories inside the application memory. Um, one of the things that I have not seen, but I kind of suspect um, is that Q, the Q tools behind the scenes will leverage and create these resources files um, the same way that uh, QMake does. Uh, but I have not had a chance to go and um, work through an example that does that. So I didn't want to actually uh, show one here. Um, but that being said, um, it is, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's a fairly straightforward process for folks who want to get started. So part of, the, part of the trouble with that is attaching files into the um, uh, attaching files into the dumped application gets difficult because you're 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 not building the application the same way Qt builds the application. Right, right. You're doing an SPCL, you know, save lisp and die or something along those lines, and so baking extra file resources into that sounds complicated, at least in a way that Qt could well could make use. But of. one thing. Same, or, man. I, I just want to uh, complete this thought. Um, yeah. Well, that's actually a, um, a very good point. Um, I'm sure there are ways to actually create um, objects that can be loaded dynamically um, into the application namespace that still uh, um, preserves the Qt semantics, but then can be leveraged on the common Lisp side um, accordingly. It might very well create a shared object um, that can then gets uh, DL opened at, at the time that you load up uh, the um, the application, very much like your current um, SO is being loaded into memory um, and hand, handled accordingly. But you know, these are all this is all speculation. I had to play around with it to actually go and really um, uh, discuss what the limitations are of that approach. Uh, Zulu, you had a you had a point, a comment. Oh yeah, well, I was going to say that um, you, another. So it's going to vary, obviously, like by platform too. Because in ECO, I bet you you would have zero trouble, you know, doing that. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. In yeah, SPCO, yeah. it's going to be, you know, that would be more tricky to get it. And I don't. Well, I say more tricky. I'm going to go ahead and admit, probably impossible to to get the executable to be, you know, in the right format to to do those things. Um, but on the flip side, this is common list, right? So at build time, you could load up those resources into, you know, an octet vector in in whatever format if you're able to then pass that along to Qt, you know, in a, in a way that it expects. But it, it sounds like your approach probably would be better of if you're able to to just generate those resources as separate like object files, like shared object files. Right. That it depends on how the machinery, um, uh, either on the Q tool side or the common QT side, handles that. I just know that it's part of um, the, the the application framework that when you're building GUI applications, especially, it's kind of important um, since uh, things like um, it enables you then to do things like styling. Um, you have the ability to style your 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 widgets in a in a in a well styling you can handle fairly easily anyway. I actually have already tinkered with styling. Styling you can do um, it through code, but you can also do it through what's called QSS, which is Yeah, yeah. No, I I I, I set a style sheet. Uh, you can pass a, a QSS string directly to set style sheet okay. uh, at the application level. So you could just load in the file as a string and then do, you know, set style. Okay, sheet. I got to try that. Um, you're saying? I mean, I, I have an example for it right here if you want to take oh, a look sweet. at it. sweet. Okay, go ahead and share your screen. One second, let me. Let me stop sharing yeah, mine. Uh, hold on. Let me just go ahead and stop sharing mine. Okay, we're floating frames. Okay, it's all yours. Convince BLC to play nice today. Let's see what that looks like. Da, 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 da. Application window, VLC, that one. How terrible does that look? Not great. One second. If I can convince VLC to be friendlier. Yeah. Trouble with doing this is that if 
I oh yeah, it needs to be wider. That's weird. Oh well. Not a whole lot I can really do about it. But anyway, so um basically I mean, there are a couple of different ways you could do it, right? So firstly, I uh, I just, in my defined sub-widget here, I did a set F on Q plus style sheet to, you know, you can just do that if you want to set it locally. But um, more generally, when you do with main window here, in the body of this, you can refer to, um, let me use my Emacs cursor. Ah, I see what you're doing. Yeah, okay. you can do set style sheet, you can then just do QT, Q application, and then you can just give a QSS style sheet string. So what you could do then is, is you can use um, with um, with open you can use Alexandria read file into string. Okay, you can use that to actually get the entire file in memory, and then pass it through. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Interesting. As an option. Yeah, that would be really nice. Because then you can, there, there's a lot of stuff that becomes really, really, it enables you to do a lot of interesting things when you're, as long as you make sure that when you dump the, when you deploy the application that the bin directory holds your QSS, um, yeah. that would be fine, that, that would work. That would work really well. Yeah, I wasn't sure about that. Like if you can register files, that's one way to do it. Like QTools, like say, oh, I need these also as part of the final executable. You know, there's a, uh, like these files that need to be put into the bin directory, then this becomes fairly straightforward. Um, I wasn't sure about that. That's the, that's the kind of things that, um, that's kind of advanced that um, it doesn't need, it necessarily deal with the machinery um, of Qt, yeah. um, but it is something that's useful. Uh, someone made a comment. Never mind. All right. But yeah. Okay. All right. So, you know. Um, so this is, I mean, I, I, I kind of put this as kind of a stopping point just because um, the machinery, um, getting into more uh, cute stuff specifically would require several days. Um, and, um, but really understanding the core of it is the same regardless you have um, the ability to hook certain Q objects with uh, a signals and slots model. Um, in the case of GUI applications, these are Q widgets. Uh, we haven't even covered all the widgets, obviously, as you can see here, because it's a very massive library. Um, one thing that um, I'm hoping folks would do after watching this um, is provide in the comments on the YouTube stream. Um, as to uh, things that they want to look at specifically in Q tools. For me, um, some of them are related to uh, the, I recently found out that um, in the documentation that there's an example of an OpenGL um, uh, example, which means that there is a possibility to create like a Q graphics view, which was uh, introduced in Qt 4.8. This allows you to create some highly interactive, very immersive applications that take advantage of hardware acceleration. Um, there are subclasses of QGL widget um, in the QT framework. Um, I just haven't had a chance to finish off that example to, to show off some of those things. Um, but uh, come next week, um, I'm hoping that uh, some of those examples will be more complete so we can go through them as well. Um, so um, that's all I have for today. Um, it's a really a short, short discussion, um, but um, it is a start of a journey in into what uh, Q tools provides and how we should leverage um, some of those things. So, um, just a couple of more announcements um, before I let you guys go. Uh, one is is we are going to be taking a short, brief hiatus um, in the month of September and October, and reconvene in um, November. Um, and uh, we're gonna finish off um, the Q tools um, discussion and hopefully we can get some time into actually doing a start on garbage collection um, before the hiatus. Um, but I just wanted to at least bring it up to folks so that they understand September and October is going to be a pretty cu busy couple of months for me. So 
um, I won't be able to actually um, do these uh, weekly discussions, unfortunately. Um, but within that time, if you guys have, you know, comments, questions, thoughts, ideas, please, please, please let me know and um, I'll take care of them. Uh, any comments from the audience, um, announcements from folks, um, our discussion topics that we should cover? All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Um, uh, I hope to see you guys next week when we continue our discussions on um, uh, on, on the Q tools. I'll see you later. Great. Bye, Thank you.